1936 bestseller. How many of you are familiar with this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? This guy has sold a book that continues to sell almost uh, 100 years after he wrote it. 1936, that's kind of impressive, right? And I remember reading this book for the first time about 20 years ago, and what really stood out to me is when you see a group photo that you're in, whose picture do you look for first? You look for your own. And with that, we want to think about the students are always looking for themselves in the material we're teaching them. And so I don't just mean in photos, but of course it's important that they see themselves in photos, so we need our photos to be diverse, but I mean this much more broadly, that we need our students to see themselves in the material. They're looking for themselves when they read. I, uh, when I was thinking about this talk, I was cleaning out my office at home, and I came across uh, one of the psychology books that Macmillan puts out, and it said, my psychology, my life. Psychology gets that. The students are looking for themselves. The same thing is true in economics. The students are looking to see themselves. And in fact, there is an entire line of pedagogical research which tells us that text cannot be understood without contributions from readers. This is a fundamental idea in teaching people reading comprehension. The text cannot be understood without a contribution from the reader. What does that mean? It means they're bringing their background into the text that they're reading, and that background that they're bringing is affecting how they are informed by the text. So this is, a, as I said, a fundamental idea in reading comprehension, and it's one of the things that explains the big gap in reading that we see um, by socioeconomic status uh, among children is that some children have a richer background that they, it's not that they're necessarily even that their parents read to them more, right? This whole idea of the word gap, and a lot of people focused on the word gap. It's not just the word gap, it's the experience gap that students, that young people come in and they say, oh yeah, that's happened to me before. I've been on this kind of playground, I've been in this kind of house. And they recognize it and they can build from that scaffolding. So here is another quote from this literature Students understand material better when they recognize the content from their own lives so that the familiarity serves as being relevant to their lives, scaffolding upon which they can build further comprehension. So when you think about your teaching materials, I want you to start thinking about the idea of how much scaffolding am I providing? And what I find in economics in particular is that we are spending too much time looking for ourselves in the photo and not enough time looking for our students in the photo. And so we need to do a better job of trying to find our students, meeting them where they're at, so that they have a stronger scaffolding upon which they can build their knowledge. So to start with that, you have to understand your students. And I don't mean to disparage anybody who teaches about beer and pizza. Everybody's fallen into that trap. But if you want to ask what, who are your students and what are they dealing with, here's some headlines I found. The quiet struggle of college students with kids. So many of us forget that a quarter of college students have children. One in four is a parent. How many childcare examples do we have in textbooks? Children matter to a lot of students. Stressed out college students are sleeping less than ever. You guys probably recognize that from your own students. Recent research has shown that the students are sleeping less and they're performing worse in college as a result. That means that they're getting less bang for their buck spending time in college because they're not getting enough sleep. Soaring housing costs are straining college students. College students are worried about paying the rent. A shocking number of Cincinnati area college students skip meals worrying about going hungry. We've seen a lot of research coming out over the last couple years about the number of students showing up at food banks, running out of food, not being able to pay for the fundamental basic needs of being able to eat. Students want mental health help but get stuck waiting in line. Student debt viewed as a major problem. Okay, this sounds all terrible. Why do I put these up there? Because your students are thinking about big problems. They're thinking about how to make their way in the world. And one of the things I liked about this last one is it points out 
that these big problems are shaping what career they choose, they're shaping what courses they take, and they're shaping what they major in. So when your students come into the classroom, they're looking for things that are going to connect to their lives, their problems, and their ambitions, which is to transcend these things and become more successful. Students, our students are really changing. No one's going to be surprised to hear me say that. This graph, though, is quite striking when you look at just the rise in college attendance. Most kids graduating from high school, the vast majority are now going on to college. The tragedy is that the vast majority are not necessarily all graduating. So we need to do a better job of getting the kids who are going to college to graduate. But it's not just, sometimes I say, you know, I want my students, I need to improve student retention. And people think I mean graduation rates. That's true. We need to improve graduation rates. But I also want them to just retain what they're learning. If they're only going to spend one year in college, let's make it a heck of a year. Let's make sure that they take something from that year, they hang on to it, and they make better decisions in their life as a result. The first generation students struggle. And there's a lot of first generation students. So roughly a third of students are first generation, meaning that they're the first ones in their family to go to college. Now increasingly, it's actually, there, I used to think you know, first generation students were an increasing share, but now we've seen the rise in college attendance go so high that they're no longer an increasing share, but they are a large share. But they look very, very different. And if you want to understand your students, you should need to understand that first generation students are different from tr other students. So um, they are more than twice as likely to leave school within three years than students whose parents have bachelor's degrees. 48% of first-gen students are on track to graduate three years after enrollment. Only 48%, not even half, compared to 66% of non-first-gen students. Almost two-thirds of first-gen students say they'd like to give back to their communities after they graduate. I mean, no judgment, but like, I really want to be teaching these kids. They want to do something really important with their education, but they're actually struggling to accomplish what they want to do. First generation and minority students are less likely to say that a professor is a mentor for them. So we're not connecting with our first gen and our minority students. It's more likely that 72% of white students identify their mentor as a professor compared with 61% of first gen students and 47% of minority students. We're not doing a good enough job connecting. College enrollment rates have risen among minority students, you can see here what I'm showing you is, is since 1993, roughly when uh, Greg Mankiw published his first Principles of Economics book, big transformational moment. What did students look like? Well, there was a gap between the likelihood of white students going to college um, and black or Hispanic students. That gap has roughly closed, although you can see some bounce and the, the data among minority students. And roughly what we're seeing is among all types of students around 70% are going to college. Now, something I've talked a lot about is the fact that your students are more likely to be female. Nearly three quarters of girls graduating high school go straight to college at either a two or four year school. Men are 10 percentage points less likely to do so. 64% of men who finish high school go on to college. Women are also the majority on college campuses. There were 135 female graduate students for every 100 male graduate students in 2015. And women earned about 52% of all doctorate degrees. Women have closed ranks on men in education. And we can see that in these graphs. The percent of men and women with either graduate school or a BA Women have just surpassed men, and the gap has continued to grow. That, that is beginning to be felt in the labor market, and it is beginning to shape the labor market. And one of the factors here is that econ is not keeping up. So here is the share of undergraduate degrees earned by women. Here's econ majors. So economics stalled in the late 1990s. I think most of us know this. But this means that we are not serving the students who are coming to us. The, the class, the school, the universities are becoming increasingly female. 
they're becoming increasingly minority students. We're having a, a large share of first generation students. And that, what do our econ majors look like? They're still disproportionately white male. Here you can see uh, the percent of graduates who are women by birth year in economics, math, engineering, physics, and biology. And what you can see is a rise in the share of women in, uh, in many other degrees, biology being above 60% now. And you can see that flatlining in economics and the rise in women in engineering, um, in physics, that has been at a slower and steadier pace, but has also slowed down at the time that econ has, uh, has de decelerated. Um, if we take a look at uh, the percent of economics graduates who are women by birth year, what you can see is we had this enormous run up, women born in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and then it stopped. We can see that racial minorities are growing on college campuses, but not in economics. So here you can see economics trending down for African American uh, BAs, where all BAs, it's trending up. Hispanic all BAs trending up strongly, uh, but in economics, that progress stalled and has even turned down. We can see, see the exact same thing when we turn to PhDs, which is a split where people going into all sorts of PhDs, uh, black and Hispanic students going on to PhDs at greater rates than before, but not in economics. So that gives you a sense of the changes. There's also another really important change on our campus that we have to recognize, which is a growing share of our students are transgender or non-binary. So I looked around for data. The best data I could get is about 2% of college students identify as transgender or non-binary. That might not sound like a lot to you, but it is actually a lot, right? It's so two out of 100. So how many of you teach 100 students over the course of a year, right? So you're likely encountering transgender or non-binary students. How do you make sure that they feel included? We know that the world is changing. There's, there are a lot of students who are not identifying uh, as male or female. They're non-binary, they're transgendered, and we don't really know exactly what to do. Um, and, but we have to make some adjustments. And, and one of the things I think is important is that we all sh start to use that third person pronoun for the singular. And I think that can be, for those of us who are older, that can be a little bit hard to be talking to an individual person and calling them they. But in fact, that's where you know, the, the college students we're teaching, that's where they are at, as a plural and as a singular. Um, and uh, as I said, we can all appreciate the awkwardness of the bathroom situation we're facing in the hotel, but at the same time, I hope you appreciate you know, the, the value that that creates for people who no longer have to feel like they're in the right or the wrong bathroom. Approximately 4.3% of adults in the U.S. identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, and roughly a third have children. But this is really small. This is aggregate Gallup data compared to what is true on college campuses. So according to the Yale Daily News, 23% of the freshman class identifies somewhere along the LGBTQ spectrum. So um, you know, this gives you a sense of like the world is moving really quickly and the students are trying to have a little bit more of a fluid sense of who and what and where they are at age 18, 19, 20. And I think that we have to start to think about identifying, uh, it, recognizing that in the classroom and not unnecessarily ignoring students for whom this is a really, really important issue. Now, that's how your students look. But you know, one of the things that I also tell my students is that college is more important than ever. So the median college graduate earns 80% more than the median high school graduate. And your students, I bet, don't know that. I use Clicker in my classroom. It's very helpful to ask questions. And one of my favorite times of the year is when I say, how much more does the median college graduate earn compared to the median high school graduate? And I put up there 20% more, 40% more, 60% more, 80% more. It's not, it's not the mo 80% isn't the modal. It's the least commonly picked answer. The students don't have any idea. They are shocked. Um, and you can see 
th this data doesn't quite match that 80% number because this is millennials age 25 to, to 32 in 2012. But here you can see it's actually not just that they earn more. It's also the unemployment rate. Look at how much lower the unemployment rate is for people with a bachelor's degree. Look at the, how much lower the share living in poverty is among those with a, uh, a bachelor's degree. So they need to be in college, and they need to be getting an education that they deserve. Here you can actually see the graph of that wage premium, and it, it bounces around. But really, in the last few the last uh, decade or so has trended upward to an average of about 80%. But here's the problem. I don't think economics is giving them the return they deserve. So we see this high return and we say, okay, that's, we want to push students into college. We want to, should we be bringing them into economics? I think we should. But we need to make sure that we're giving them the return that they deserve. And economics majors in their senior year can't pass a basic literacy test and barely do better than non-economics majors. In other words, they're not retaining what we're teaching them, even when they major in our subject. And we should think of that as something that we should put all of our energy into fighting. We need, if, if we're gonna be useful, if we're gonna be part of that 80% return, we have to teach them something they remember, right? That's like fundamental. We have to teach them something they remember and they use so that they are earning more because they took economics. Economic students come into the classroom with preconceived ideas about economic policy and leave with the same preconceived ideas. And what that means is that we are doing a terrible job of selling them on the ideas of economics. A terrible job. So, you know, I think about this like any profession when you really stop and think about their sort of fundamental ideas. And they, people go out and they try to teach the world their fundamental ideas. And so medicine has taught me that I wash my hands before I eat, after I go to the bathroom, all the time. Wash my hands, don't get sick. I can't actually see germs on my hands. I don't know for sure that they're right. And I've actually never run any kind of personal experiment to see if I get sicker by not washing my hands for a few weeks. Um, so wh why do I do it? You know, it, it's, it's costly to wash your hands, right? There's a cost, like I have to stop, it takes some time, or I have to nag my seven-year-old to wash his hands. Like my hands get chapped in the winter. It's not free, but I trust and believe the medical science that tells me that there's a payoff for doing it and that the payoff is high. And I think we as economists need to be able to teach. That doesn't mean we have to, we have to show students in a way that will allow more of the public to believe the things that we tell them that's hard to believe, like the concept of comparative advantage. It turns out, by the way, that the thing that's been doing the best job of teaching them about comparative advantage is actually removing comparative advantage by, um, by the trade policies that the United States has been pursuing. Um, that's been a little bit puzzling to me, but what we see in the data is that more people believe in trade today than did uh, five years ago. So. Uh, maybe, you know, one way is take it away. <laughs> then the third problem that I think we can and should do better at is economics majors become less cooperative members of society as they confuse the idea of rational decisions with selfish decisions. We unwittingly, and I really believe unwittingly, because when I talk to economists, they tell me all the time, oh, I don't want to be telling students what they should and shouldn't do. Yet they walk out of your class and think what they should do is be a jerk and that you told them that that was the best way to maximize their utility. They can maximize their utility by being a jerk to others. And that's a mistake, but it's not just a mistake, like it's, it's bad social service. As a profession, we're creating more jerks and we really should stop doing that. But it's not just that we are doing this bad service to society, it's also the case that people who are naturally disinclined to being selfish think that economics is not for them. I have students who come in to my policy class, my applied policy for micro, and they say to me, I hated economics, and I don't want to take your class, and I hate that I'm forced to take it, because I believe in doing good for the world. And you can't believe in doing good for the world and believe in economics. And that's just not true, that's false. And it's a misinterpretation of what we mean by maximizing utility. Economics doesn't tell you to be selfish. You're not maximizing your own utility when you're being selfish if that's not who you truly are.
but our students don't know that. Um, and then finally, instructors report that students rarely read their textbook. And I think too many people accept this as a fact. They say, oh, it doesn't matter what the textbook is because students rarely read it. Instead of thinking maybe the causation is that students aren't reading the textbook because the textbook isn't speaking to them. They don't see themselves in the textbook and so it's not useful and so they stop reading. So I don't want to, I think it's a mistake to take it as a given that students won't read their book. Okay, so quick recap, students have and continue to change. College is important, college is expensive, and economics isn't delivering to the newer students. So how can we do better? I think we need to make our textbooks more inclusive. We need to meet students more where they are in order to leverage their existing scaffolding and their understanding of the world and make the material more useful. So there are some concrete things here I'm gonna, gonna talk through, but some of it is really just to emphasize that when we talk about having broad examples, this is not a nice to have. Broad examples, a bunch of different kinds of examples, are important because they are about trying to have each student be able to find themselves in the material, even if they have very different lives. I want the student who's juggling two kids at home and is a single mom to see herself in the material. I want the first generation student who's going home and looking after their adult parents who are sort of, you know, barely holding themselves together to be able to see themselves in the material. I want the student who does come from a long family of college graduates to see themselves in the material. And so how do I speak to all of them? I have to make sure that there are examples that reach every student. So some of the problems that we see in the textbooks is that women are not in economics textbooks. I don't think this was purposely done by anybody. I think it comes from this idea of looking for yourself in the photo, and the instructors who write textbooks tend to be men, and they find themselves in the photo, and they write themselves into the textbook. The examples, when I read textbooks, I can see the, the examples reflect the thing the textbook's author, author is interested in. So one thing is that, that you have to fight against that. The same thing's probably true in your classroom. It's, it's so much, I mean, it's hard to think of things that you're not thinking of. You don't know what you don't know, right? And that's the problem. But we have to try to figure out how do we bring uh, examples that are fresher to students' lives into our classroom, even when they're unnatural to us. But what we see is that in textbooks, women are 6% of the real business leaders, 7% of the policymakers, 8% of the economists, 24% of the public figures, 41% of the made up and ordinary people. This is not because, and so here you can, uh, now you can actually see what the real world looks like. The orange, the light orange bars represent real world data. It's not that the textbooks, it's not, ooh, you know, we can't help it, CEOs are mostly male, that's true. Shouldn't we at least represent the real world? Shouldn't that dark red bar be at least as wide as the, as the light orange bar? If we look at inventors or entrepreneurs, it's true, mostly male. We do even worse when it comes to the econ textbooks. You know, uh, so the same thing is true in all of these, that, uh, that we could and should uh, be able to do better by just approximating the real world, even if that doesn't take us to equality. And I think this is because there are many people in economics who fundamentally believe that this is not an issue we should care about. So this is the preface to a, a book on game theory, a very good and well-known book on game theory by Osborne and Rubinstein. And Ariel Rubinstein remains committed to the idea that he is gender neutral and that we should use only references to he because everything else is a, is a distraction because he says, agrees that we should use a, a neutral pronoun and agrees to the use of he with the understanding that he refers to both men and women. Continuous reminders of the he, she issue simply divert the reader from the section's, uh, reader's attention from the main issues. Language is extremely important in shaping our thinking, but in academic material, it's not useful to wave it as a flag. This is in the preface of this book. It says, just assume the world is male and like get on with it and like let debate elsewhere in other topics whether the world is male. The problem is that your female students are reading this and they're constantly reminded that it's not them. 
So the, the sort of basics from this is principles of economics textbooks are full of men. The men in, are three quarters of the people in economics textbooks, and it's not because they're all economists. The women in the economics textbooks take fewer actions, are more likely to be involved in entertainment, education, or household tasks, why the men make decisions in business or policy. So it's this uh, you know, sort of implicit, it's very implicit gender bias that we can see clearly in books. So let me turn directly now to how should you be thinking about your students. So for every thousand students taking an introductory economics course, one in 10 will major in economics. So if you're teaching your intro course to majors, you are missing nine in 10 of the students. And we should be paying a lot of attention to that nine in 10. But you no, know, there are trade-offs. And right now, what we tend to do is focus on the one in 10 and ignore the nine in 10. But let me tell you, it gets worse than that. Because it's not just that fewer than one in 10 will major in economics. Only one in 100 of those majors will work as economists. So one in a 1,000 people that you teach principles of economics to will go on to work in economics. So what are you teaching them to do? You're not teaching them to become an economist. You're teaching them to make economic decisions. Because every single person will do that. So when I talk about students being able to see themselves, I want them to see the kinds of decisions they are going to make in their life. And those decisions are not about, they're not economics decisions. What kind of decisions are they? Consumers deciding how much to spend versus save. Every student will make that decision. Savers looking for a good rate of return. Investors incurring an upfront cost in order to get future benefits. Investing in their education. They're all investors right then and there sitting in your classroom. Every single one of them. What kind of return are they going to get? They invest in their health. They invest in their friendships. They're workers trying to figure out how much to work. How many hours should they work while they're in school? How should they balance it? What will they do when they graduate? Managers deciding how many workers to hire. When I said earlier, speak to the students' aspirational selves. Most of them will go on to be managers, and almost all of them want to. Importers buying products from abroad. Exporters selling their services or goods abroad. So, Economics doesn't have to be dismal, it's useful. And when you tap into the useful side, you can reach more students because you can talk to them about the lives they're actually living. So what does that usefulness mean? It means that we have to focus on these roles that our students actually play as economic actors, shifting the perspective from, uh, from spectators to actors and engaging in these roles that students are going to play and helping them learn to do economics. When we focus on helping the students make good decisions throughout our classroom experience, when they're, they're thinking about, should I go to graduate school? You're speaking directly to them. They're seeing themselves. They're thinking about their decision. Should I, uh, you know, what should I do over the summer? Should I take a job that's going to increase my, put me on my, the trajectory that where I'm going to get a good job? Or should I just try to make a lot of money? Should I get the highest paying job? Or should I take that internship that pays minimum wage? Or that unpaid internship? How do I think through that decision? When you're talking to students about these kind of really important choices they're making, you're reaching them because they're seeing themselves in the material and their lives on every page. When we think about broadly applicable principles beyond that traditionally pecuniary domain, when we're thinking about things beyond uh, you know, money and banking, we can apply the toolkit to thinking about our personal lives. And our personal lives, as well as our financial lives, mean that we can reach every student. So, uh, I'll give you one example and then, then wrap up. So um, when we think about comparative advantage, it's a really important concept for explaining international trade. And a traditional example is thinking about Britain trading cloth for wine from Portugal. So the thing about this is, first of all, is it, it focuses on inter the international aspect. 
But comparative advantage is actually really about task allocation. And your students are in the process of making trade-offs right then and there, usually, in their daily lives about who to assign tasks to. Which one of the roommates should cook dinner? Who should clean? Do they have a chore chart? How do they divide things up? And comparative advantage says assign each task to the person who can do it at the lowest opportunity cost, the next best use of that person's time. When you talk to students about, hey, do you do more work around uh, your apartment when your roommate's got an exam? And does your roommate chip in and do more work when you have an exam? That's something that relates to their lives. Comparative advantage applies any time you have to assign tasks. So we can think about you know, within a band, the Beatles. Uh, as many people know that uh, uh, Ringo Starr wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. <laughs> within a family, within a company. That broadness, when, when should you buy pre-cut vegetables or chop them at home yourself? This broadness helps students see themselves in the material. So when we think about making principles of economics more interesting, we need more real world examples so students recognize the world that we're describing to them. We need to make economics useful to their lives. We need to explore a wider variety of industries. How many of you default to teaching about agriculture or manufacturing, or at least see that in your textbooks. And yet the agricultural sector is 2% of the economy. Manufacturing, there are more people working in office support jobs than there are in the goods producing sector in the United States. You would be better off talking about personal assistants, secretaries, administrative assistants, than talking about manufacturing. So we need to explore that wider variety of industries, the ones that the students are actually interacting with, the ones that they're going to work in. Focus more on examples that will resonate with, and here I've made a mistake, both genders. All genders, right? And that uh, focusing on examples that will resonate with all genders, exploring good decision making in their own lives as consumers, savers, and workers, and math is really easy to teach and to test. And it's really important that we emphasize the concepts if we want students to retain it and use it in their everyday lives. You know, I once had a student walk into my office who had gotten A's in, in micro, and she was doing applied public policy. And she said, I could derive the elasticity of demand and supply for you right now, but I don't know what they're for. Why do I want to know it? It's actually a really important concept. If you are ever thinking about whether you should rise, raise the price of your product, you certainly want to understand, is your revenue going to go up or down? So you need to know the magnitude of the decline in sales you're going to face. She didn't understand that part, but she knew the math. Don't let that happen to your students. We need to combat our implicit bias. We typically rely on stereotypes and other cognitive shortcuts more heavily when there are you know, more unknowns to a situation. Being aware of our implicit bias is the first step to overcoming these stereotypes. We're all going to make them. I just wrote both genders on a slide where I actually had spent hours looking up how many people, students, uh, identified as non-gender binary. So we make mistakes, but we have to be aware of our implicit biases to even begin to start to overcome them. Professors may be well positioned to actually disrupt classroom hierarchies which can emerge among students based on characteristics like race and gender and academic ability, and positive reinforcements can help break stereotypes and equalize the learning conditions in the classroom. Other fields are taking action. Here I've got the principles that the UK's Institute of Physics devised. We need to be taking those actions. You might have noticed the economic, American Economic Association's gotten a little bit more on board with thinking hard through these kinds of problems. I think all of economics needs to do the same thing. So I'll wrap up by saying, look, the first principles of reaching all students and teaching inclusively comes back to how to win friends and influence people. Talk in terms of the other person's interests, make the other person feel important, and do it sincerely. And that's what we need to be doing when we teach 101. Thank you. Thank you.